Our speaker this evening is Dr. Laura Holland Green of the University of Arizona, where as most of you were in on the chat, you already know she wears two hats. She's a professor of architecture as well as the associate dean for academic affairs. Our own Virginia Jensen, who is here, was a reader on Dr. Holland Green's dissertation at the University of California, Berkeley. Virginia says of Dr. Holland Green that she has, and I quote, always found that Laura's thinking and perspective was adventurous and way beyond the box, which is probably one reason she's able to bridge the medieval and the modern. Her talk this evening will show us those abilities as it focuses on relating current mixed reality and virtual reality design to the medieval precedences that sought, similarly sought to create opportunities for liminal experiences by means of such things as portals to the divine. The title of our talk is Design at the Border, Liminality in Medieval and Postmodern Contexts. There you go. It's all yours, Dr. Paul Green. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. And I've known about your seminar for some time through Virginia. I haven't seen Virginia for a while, but um, we, uh, you know, in years past regularly met up at conferences, which was always just a delight to um, catch up and uh, share what we were thinking about in medieval studies. Um, and it's a particular pleasure for me to be with you as um, folks who are enamored of the Middle Ages, because I would say that's not my daily reality in a school of architecture. Um, you know, in graduate school, we historians are trained as specialists in particular periods, but typically if you're teaching in a school of architecture, you are treated as and expected to be a generalist, to have broad knowledge across many periods and to try to make that accessible to students studying to become practitioners of architecture. Um, so I've always found that um, an interesting and exciting thing, but it does have a bit of an opportunity cost in terms of the amount of time I'm able to spend uh, speaking with fellow medievalists or, or people um, uh, well-informed about the Middle Ages. So um, it's, it's really a delight to be with you. I've had the pleasure of uh, working in the last few years with a colleague named Rebecca Rouse. And Rebecca is a former student of mine from Georgia Tech. Uh, she was not in architecture, she was in digital media. And she did an independent study with me, which was about uh, museum environments and other uh, contexts of, of display. And then I served on her uh, dissertation committee. And what's been a, a pleasure about working with her is that uh, she is both a prolific scholar, but also a practitioner of digital media. She's a designer herself who works with um, uh, various institutions, theater companies, museums, heritage sites, to help design um, digital uh, materials for them. And we really have enjoyed talking across our two disciplines. And I have a first slide that for me represents the opportunity to try to translate between different languages. When I first began teaching in a school of architecture, having studied art history along the way, I really came to feel that I was speaking a different language from my colleagues. In fact, there was one point at which I thought, we're actually talking about the same thing. We're just using entirely different lexicons to describe it. And that then posed to me the wonderful challenge of learning how to translate from one's own language into another language, which is what I've um, had to do with Rebecca as well. So the image you're looking at is a famous um, illumination from uh, the Rohan hours, and it shows the dead man before God. But the reason I've always liked this image is that I realized that the dead man in speaking to God, of course, addresses God in Latin, right? That um, 
is an appropriate recognition of uh, the dignity and the power of God. But God, in speaking back, speaks in French. So he addresses the dead man in his own language. And uh, the banderoles that you see um, with the text uh, capture that. And I have just the beginnings of uh, what is said by each, uh, each person um, on this slide. So for me, that process of translation between different languages and different disciplines is an opportunity to step into a kind of generosity towards others and to practice the hospitality of informing them about the way you do things in your own neck of the woods, while also learning from them how they do things. And um, it, it remains for me an exciting challenge in my teaching um, and in my research. So Rebecca and I began to have a conversation about claims that are made today on behalf of new platforms of uh, virtual reality or mixed reality or augmented reality. And we both felt somewhat frustrated by the claims made, uh, claims of never before imagined, never before experienced effects of immersion and absorption. Um, and you know, the historian in both of us felt a little offended by that kind of claim because we knew or we suspected that works in the past invited their viewers or their users into something that felt absolutely as immersive, as absorptive as the things you see in an image like this uh, from a recent movie. And so we wanted to begin to work from the perspective of media archaeology to, to look back to precedents, not direct influences, we're not claiming that, but precedents where similar things are going on with different tools. And that then tends to de-emphasize the technology aspect of virtual reality and augmented reality and instead focus on the, on the, the desired impact. So, um, you know, in this study, uh, the definition of virtual reality, and I'm really borrowing from, from Rebecca's work, is that it is something that provides you with an entrance into an environment that is coherent and immersive, even though it's wholly simulated. So, uh, Virtual reality is marked by an absence of the seams or the borders between um, the, the real space of the viewer and the virtual space of the representation. Uh, and in fact, I think the fullness of the illusion uh, not only effaces the means of representation, um, but I believe it also reduces the agency of the viewer you're cast, perhaps paradoxically, this, this may not seem to make sense, but I believe you're cast into a more passive role in virtual reality, precisely because the entire um, virtual world is presented to you uh, whole. And I think people might criticize uh, virtual reality um, applications as a uh, creating a kind of solipsism on the part of the user, right? You've got these goggles on, you're completely separated from anything and anyone around you while you're invited into this um, immersive experience. And one can look at, say, museum visitors with their goggles or headsets on and feel that there's something quasi-antisocial um, about um, entering this kind of experience. By contrast, augmented reality is something that works differently. It offers layers of material that has not been fully assimilated, but comes from different sources, even different disciplines. It actually calls attention to the seams between different kinds of information or different kinds of images. And it invites your 
agency because you, the user, choose which layers you want to deploy or you want to investigate. Um, and even more than that, the base reality that is augmented is the reality of the physical world. Um, overlaid on that is the information, for instance, that you might um, that you might tap into through this phone app, what was there, where you point your phone at a historical building and you can call up information uh, about that building. So you're still in the, the physical world, you're opposite the building, and yet you're able to choose um, to access this additional information. But for Rebecca and me, this scenario has proven to be particularly interesting uh, with regard to um, works from the Middle Ages and works in the present. I myself tend to find virtual reality things less than engaging. Uh, I don't tend to find them as um, mimetic of uh, the, the, the world around us as their creators claim. And in fact, um, you know, I, I prefer having uh, my choice of what I, what I access. Um, but it's powerful to me as a, an art historian and an architectural historian that the actual substance of things in the world is the base from which augmented reality um, operates. So um, I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, two works from the Middle Ages, uh, one briefly and the second at greater length, um, that are then framing a brief look at two contemporary works of mixed reality, just to get you thinking about how we are trying to put together a kind of theory of how these works operate. And we've come up with a formulation that the virtual in, in either virtual reality or an augmentation is situated precisely at the threshold between, um, between worlds. Um, so when we were first exploring this idea, the, the work that came immediately to my mind is this famous um, manuscript, another uh, a book of hours, The Hours of Mary of Burgundy. And um, this is something that was painted in the 1470s in Flanders probably for Mary of Burgundy, who was the only child of Charles the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy. And it's a celebrated manuscript now in Vienna, celebrated because of, of its very successful illusionism. So in particular with these window miniatures, we're um, invited to look through an aperture into a world beyond, whether it's in uh, a church or it's um, Golgotha on the right, um, and we seem to have at least visual access to that other world. So let's let's pick this apart a little bit, and, that, and that's what we tried to do um, in our initial conversations. Um, in the miniature on the left, uh, you see Mary of Burgundy, that's presumably a portrait of her, uh, sitting in a niche or a chapel, um, which is in the foreground, and she's fingering a book, which we are led to believe is the very book in which um, this image uh, appears. And as she meditates on the hours of the Virgin, she's granted a vision of the Virgin Mary and the Christ child in this Gothic choir beyond. Um, and they are accompanied by several figures, including another version of Mary of Burgundy kneeling before them in veneration. So clearly the book is the conduit for this vision as Mary meditates on the hours. Um, and, you know, we see her in active devotion, right? That she, she makes an active choice to engage the text. Um, and that engagement allows the augmentation of her present reality with this vision of uh, holy beings, being in the presence of, of holy beings. Um, so there's an infiltration of the border, right? Or at least movement back and forth across um, that border. 
If you look more carefully, you'll see that edges or thresholds or seams are in fact thematized. They're not hidden, right? So we have this beautiful um, aperture, this window with its um, the two valves, the two shutters pulled back, right? We see the, the shallow space of a shelf on which Mary has her rosary um, and some flowers. And, uh, you know, we, we see her reading in that space. And beyond it, you know, framed almost like a picture is the, the view um, into the, the sacred space that opens beyond. If you look more carefully, what's interesting is that the vantage point from which the perspective is constructed, the viewpoint is not, in fact, that of Mary depicted there reading her book, right? In fact, her eyes are on her book. She's fingering the, the luscious surface of the vellum with her fingers. So there's a tactile, um, a tactile pleasure there. But we, the viewers of the manuscript, see the space, uh, especially um, the space beyond, from a point further to the right, uh, possibly aligned with that, um, uh, what seems to be a seat opposite Mary. And so my sense looking at this image is that the true invitation, the true agency, the true choice is not that of Mary in the image, but of Mary outside the image. Mary of Burgundy, who picks up her prayer book, who looks at it in the same way that we, the external viewers, do from a space outside the work. So the book is the base physical reality that is augmented by architectural illusionism in this image, um, which allows the holy to kind of erupt uh, in, in the world. Um, and the seams here, I think, imply not just two spaces, but three. So that the scenario of augmentation begins in our space with someone, with Mary, picking up her book to look at, as you then see her doing here. The image on the right is seems analogous, right? And the framing of this view beyond and the careful marking of the threshold between um, the, the contemporary space in the foreground and the space of biblical event in the background. Um, but it's a little different in the handling of the book itself, which I think is so fascinating. So there again is uh, Mary in the first image. And here, the two books. So the book is important in both images, um, but the one on the left, that book appears fairly docile, right? It's resting there calmly on the shelf. Mary is uh, manipulating it with her slender fig uh, fingers, as you see. But the book in the other image uh, has pages that appear to flutter in a breeze that uh, we might imagine is blowing towards us from Golgotha, um, or it's fluttering just in the presence of the drama of the events there. And if you look carefully at this detail of that manuscript, you can see that even though the pages are crimped, if you look on the left side, you'll see that those pages are bent as though they've been bent to try to hold them in place. And the cloth is overlapping them on the right to keep the book open. Even so, the pages move as though the book were alive. So it's much more active visually and it's more expressive than the book in the earlier image. Um, it really emphatically holds, oops, sorry, holds the corner uh, of that image. And now, as you can see, um, the, the worshiper, the person uh, reciting the hours, is absent. So the book alone stands in for the activation of the text um, in, that, in that meditation. So uh, these, these were um, early examples, trying to think about those layers, the way you're led from space to space over these thresholds, um, and how that um, 
augmented experience of a book in one's own world with these devotional visions that are called forth by, um, uh, by meditation. So we then were seeking examples of mixed or augmented reality works in the present that we think are particularly effective. Um, and I'm going to show you one that, that we think is very effective, one that is less effective, and then uh, we'll come back to um, a medieval work. And along the way, I'll point out that these different works I'm describing correspond to different types of liminal design that we're trying to erect into a kind of typology. Uh, so we, we have a larger research project that we'll continue um, after uh, the work we're engaged in right now. But one type is the handheld object, right? And so these small books of ours are handheld objects, and there are many others, many other devotional aids in the Middle Ages um, that become portals to other worlds. Um, this is a, a rather different example by a contemporary um, a digital artist named Christoph Vodichko, who is associated with the Media Lab at MIT. Uh, and he's really a prolific artist, often working with projections, as you see here. So this is an example, this and the next work of his I'm going to show you, are examples of something that appears to come to life. I don't believe that this particular work, um, I think it was a static projection uh, onto the architecture building at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, but I hope you find it as strange and compelling as I do, because we have an image of the entrance to this building and the steps that, that climb up to it, uh, framed by these hands as though, um, uh, a person of authority, clearly a male person of authority, were sitting in a chair there, gripping the arms of the chair, facing out to you, facing off with you perhaps, um, as you approach this building. So I think it's a rather interesting meditation on the kind of authority that inheres in academic architecture, um, I don't know much about this building, but if it's, say, a, a, a neoclassical building in any way, then that would uh, further that, um, that layering of projection on architecture that invites us to think about that building in a new way and uh, what it represents for the students um, and the faculty who use it. But an even better example of a work that appears to come to life this is something attested in medieval works as well, is this example, a much more recent work by Vodichko um, called the War Veteran Projection. And in a minute, I'm gonna show you a, a brief clip uh, from the, the, the moving projection. But in essence, I want you to know that um, the, the physical base here is a statue of Abraham Lincoln that was created in, I think, 1870 for uh, Union Square in New York City. And um, it's no longer in its original location. It was moved uh, when the, the square and the park were uh, overhauled in the 1930s. So it's now in a location that is less prominent than um, the one it occupied originally. So it's kind of hidden and it's surrounded. There's a playground at the base of it and there's all kinds of stuff going on. So I tend to imagine that this is a, a monument that has become almost invisible to those who live in that area and pass by it uh, regularly. But let's see what Vodichko does with this. So I'm gonna show you a clip probably for about two minutes. And I hope the sound will play. In a wartime situation, they train you for different combat duties, but they never train you for the actual event. So the actual event is when you, when all your human senses go into withdrawal or go into overload, 
is that's when you start smelling the blood. That's when you can distinguish a body, how far it is by the smell of the blood and the raw and the and the uh, the flesh, the composed flesh. You can you can smell either one of them from 100 meters. You know where where somebody is dead at. That's because of that wind brought the scent over to you. It makes you shake even without having anything in front of you that makes you scared. It makes you shake. It's horrifying. Uh, these dreams. Go into the remains. It's the first line of attack, and you're going to die. Pretty much. So we're sitting in the kitchen and we're talking. And I'm like, okay, you're going to die. And he just looked at me and gave me a look at any teenage kid. I mean, because he was what Nicholas was like around 18 and a half. So any teenage kids, oh, you know, you're just blowing, you know, blowing hot air and stuff like that. So we got into a very intense argument. He's like, well, then why would you tell me? I would think that you would understand what I'm doing. The daydreams, they sneak up upon you. From the left to the right of your eye, you see flashes, black flashes. When you concentrate and try to be still, because you start shaking again, thinking that you are in the aroma area, the compound area. Wake up, people. Help the veterans. Do something for the veterans. Okay, basically. Okay, so maybe you can see that what Vodichko has done, and, and you saw him with his camera in some of that footage, is created an almost perfect registration between the recordings of these veterans speaking about their experience in, in the different wars that our country has fought in recent years. There's a perfect registration of that, of their bodies, in projection on the body of Lincoln in the statue. And because of that, the statue appears almost inhabited by these other people, these, and they're all black, or not all, almost all, uh, black American veterans. So there are all kinds of inversions that are happening here, um, not just between the white president and commander in chief and these, these black, foot soldiers in, in the battles of our country, but also between uh, people whose service tends to be unrecognized and undervalued and um, the, the grand monument for this leader of the country and on and on. What interests us is um, how, how effective this is, but also how it tends to reactivate the urban space around the statue. And you could see people coming up, watching, probably, attracted initially by the sound of voices and then seeing the faces um, uh, of the veterans to whom those voices belong uh, once they got closer. So a multimedia work that again uses something that is um, a, a physical artifact in our world as the base and augments that with other media that um, bring the accepted meanings of that monument into question. Uh, so I, I think this is just a, a wonderful work in, in every way. Our other example of a memorial um, that is less successful, although also based in augmented reality is this example of a border memorial. So this is a phone app that you would use if you were here in Southern Arizona in proximity to the border, you could be out in the landscape and um, it's connected to uh, GIS data that shows the location of migrant deaths um, in proximity to the border. So if you point your phone at one of these sites um, it calls up this skeletal image um, with, familiar from Mexican culture, and that image sort of floats in the air to signify the site of, um, of someone's death. And uh, let me just show you um, what that looks like on this guy's website. Um, so again, using uh, Google Earth, no, I'm not sure if that's going to play.
yeah, to home in on our, it's going very slowly, on our part of the world and the density of deaths here in proximity to the border. So you see this massing, this army of skeletons here um, uh, representing those numbers. So what's interesting in this work is that the base is the site. There's no body present at any of these sites, um, but there's a kind of uh, linkage through code uh, from the GIS data to, uh, to the phone, which you hold in your hand. So for us, this is an example of um, almost a kind of wearable extension of the body that allows this augmentation. And I'm gonna go back, to, sorry, uh, back to my um, images here. The problem I think is that the abstraction of the, of the um, skeletal figures is not very compelling. And the way they sort of float uh, as though weightless um, doesn't seem like the right match for loss of life and you know, people who found their end um, in these different locations. So the, you know, the, the impulse is good, but the actual realization of this for us as, as a kind of memorial is less effective than what Vodichko did with the veterans. So, you know, those are some examples of the kind of augmentation that we're talking about, where you're experiencing something in a, a corporeal way with your bodily senses on site, and you're provided uh, further information um, as part of that experience or, or further, um, uh, yeah, further effective experience uh, through that augmentation. So, two other examples of what we believe are augmented reality in the Middle Ages are um, at larger scale. So either built environments that are overwhelming in their effect, so the Gothic cathedral might well be one of these, where the, um, the marriage of different media at the scale involved in those churches and uh, with, with light and sound and so forth, uh, represents an augmentation of life on earth with a vision of heaven. Um, and extreme environments are another category for us. So this site in Syria, the, um, the cult site of St. Simeon Stylites at Kalat Siman, uh, really combines those two types. And I have to say, I've been interested in this site for ages. It's an early Byzantine site from the fifth century. So between the periods of Constantine and Justinian, a huge complex of very fine architecture really celebrated as perhaps the major work in the Eastern uh, Roman Empire um, in, in that period between those two emperors. So let's see how it's organized and, and where the aspects of liminality might be at this site. So in case uh, St. Simeon Stylites is not someone you've heard of or know anything about, um, he uh, takes his name, the epithet Stylites, comes from the Greek word stylos for column. So he was the initiator of a very strange ascetic practice, which was standing atop a monumental column as a means of distancing himself from uh, human society around him. And uh, he was copied by a number of later um, stylites, including uh, Simeon the Younger, um, because of the fame of his practice, uh, the length of his life. He died at approximately 72. And this uh, absolutely um, dedicated pursuit of uh, praise of God, prayer, and penitence. And so in order to further forsake the world around him, he actually moved two or three times to successively taller columns, beginning on one that was about nine feet tall and ending up, as far as we can 
calculate uh, a top one that was about 60 feet tall. Um, and he died on top of that column after about 40 years as a stylite atop the column under the elements, in the elements, um, for all those years. And uh, in, in case you're an aficionado of uh, modern cinema, you uh, might know or might look up this film by the great Spanish filmmaker Buñuel, uh, Simon of the Desert, uh, which gives his vision of, of what this um, uh, site of St. Simeon may have looked like. Um, Buñuel, I think, was not a fan of the church, so in his movie you see Simeon undergo a number of temptations um, that are strange and uh, not, um, not shown in medieval garb, but um, this, I think, is, a, is an interesting image of this column sort of out in the wilderness, which is where Simeon sought exile from his family and from other people. So the architectural site that was built around the column on which he had stood is marked here um, on this map. It's, um, oh, it's maybe about 20 miles outside Aleppo in Syria. Um, it was not the wilderness like the deserts in Egypt at the time that Simeon lived, uh, but it was outside any village or city. So it was out in the, you know, um, in the countryside beyond uh, settled areas. And uh, here you see uh, it in its current ruined state, uh, an aerial view. Um, but even, even in this state, I think uh, you get a sense of the monumentality of this complex, which had, um, you know, two main parts. There was the uh, the church building built around the column of Simeon that honored him. Um, and then there were other uh, monastic buildings that housed those who um, kind of tended to the cult of Simeon and who welcomed pilgrims to this site. So a number of other buildings, two baptistries, hostels for pilgrims, uh, and so on. And really, the column is the emblem of Simeon, right? Uh, in, in every image of, of the saint in Eastern and Western art, you see him atop his column. Um, and here, there's an acolyte climbing a ladder in order to um, uh, speak with him, possibly provide food, uh, and so on. And the column is what is at the center of the octagonal um, core of the church, uh, as you see it in the plan on the right. The climax of this entire site was that octagon. Uh, so there's a terrific centripetal movement from the outside penetrating through the layers of this monastery um, outside the, the nearest town to the base of this column, to be in the presence of this relic of the saint. Um, so perhaps in my description now, you've already had a sense of those layers that frame one's movement, uh, one's choice of movement to this site. Um, and those were deployed largely by the church itself, the institution of the church and the guardians of the site. Um, but they did seek to make this a climactic experience, one's arrival in the octagon um, at the base of the column. You see now all that survives of that column, a single eroded drum that actually, um, you know, in the course of the current civil war in Syria is no longer on its pedestal, as you see it here in an older photograph. This gives you a sense of kind of the remoteness of this site, the villages in the distance uh, below. So um, in thinking about liminality, we can begin with the, the body of Simeon 
sorry, I've got that misspelled on the slide. Um, you can, we can think about the body of Simeon itself to begin with, because the, his body was the initial site of his ascetic uh, discipline. Um, and here's all that he did uh, in a kind of mortification of the body, this sort of living martyrdom. Uh, he was regarded as a stationary saint, so he stood in place for days, weeks, months, and years atop this column. Uh, up there in this very circumscribed space, he repeatedly prostrated himself and prayed. He refused food except once per week. This is all according to the lives <laughs> of St. Simeon. Um, his body was so degraded that there was a terrific stench. Um, and he also really controlled access to himself. So highly controlled interactions with others. And in this way, he really made himself seem like something non-human, uh, a strange being um, that some described as angelic, you know, up, of a different uh, stature. And uh, it, it, I'm going to show you a number of images from different uh, points in time, just so you get a sense of how ubiquitous the iconography of the column is for this saint. So this is a late medieval fresco from Kosovo, but there you see him um, and a description from uh, one of the lives that describes him like many early Christian and early Byzantine saints in um, terms of sport or uh, even uh, warfare as a combatant, an athlete, a warrior in the army of the Lord. And, uh, you know, one of the most famous uh, discussions of this saint and how he functioned in his contemporary <laughs> society comes from Peter Brown, a very early article by Peter Brown, who uh, talks about this angelic or almost non-human <laughs> being achieving a kind of objectivity that made it possible for him to mediate in local political and social disputes. Um, and I love Brown's phrasing here that um, this objectivity was thought acceptable only in a man who could be observed in the act of forging total dissociation, right? Hammering it out like cold metalwork via his asceticism. So that gives you a sense of the labor of this dissociation from the sinful uh, world uh, uh, on earth. So his bodily practice put him in a way beyond the pale, right? Beyond the pale of human society, of, of human relations, at least that was the goal, right? To dedicate himself entirely to God. Um, uh, but he attracted interest precisely because he was regarded as particularly pious, which meant that he never really achieved his goal of exile from the world because people sought him out for his help in their very real, very mundane problems. And um, the architecture of the site becomes the tool for organizing the approach to the holy man. Um, and uh, for choreographing the perception of his holiness um, on the site. And this really has to do with the, the function of the column. So um, there are just wonderful early images of Simeon. The one on the left is one of my favorites with this serpent uh, wound around the column. And I'm actually unsure. I think we tend to regard that as an image of temptation, but actually there are miracles where Simeon heals serpents. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on in this, in, in this image. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the serpent is a malign figure um, in this particular image. Um, we also have works like this. This was a pilgrim's token known as a eulogia or a blessing, something you could buy on site and take home with you, um, really as a kind of relic of the site because it was made from dust of the site itself. And um, 
what's so fascinating about these objects, a recent scholar has shown that on the, um, um, the reverse of this, uh, you see the imprint of the hand of the maker. So on the right, you see the texture, the lines of the palm of the person who fashioned this object out of clay, which I think is just a fascinating, um, you know, trace of the labor of that person. And of course, there were other images like this, uh, a famous uh, manuscript um, image from the Menologion of Basil II. So in all of this, again, the column is critical. And even in this um, abstracted drawing of a graffito from a stable, uh, part of a, a, a you know, setting for animals elsewhere in Syria, you don't see the body of the saint anymore. You simply see the column as the attribute that distinguishes him. And the question I think is, what did this column do for him? I mean, that you want to exile yourself from the world we can make sense of that, but why stand on a column? That seems like a very strange <laughs> thing to do. And um, part of it has to do, I think, with occupying an axis mundi, an axis between heaven and earth, and being lifted up so that one is at a point between heaven and earth. And there are many descriptions of uh, Simeon that get at this. I'm gonna try to, sorry, I'm gonna hide this panel if I can. Yeah, well, no, sorry. It's not allowing me to do that, but um, so, you know, he's lifted up as a son of the resurrection, as a living icon, and he's poised there between heaven and earth. And, and that, that location is something that endows him with, with power. So the column is the mechanism that puts him up um, in that high place. Um, we know, of course, as well, that columns uh, uh, represented monumental pedestals for statues of people in the past. So the column of Trajan um, in Rome or the column of Constantine in Istanbul. Um, these were well-known and broadly experienced um, works of triumphal architecture. And Simeon is therefore like a living statue uh, uh, put up on this pedestal. We know, in addition, that there were pillar cults in that part of Syria. So there's an aspect of this that seems to tap into local indigenous practice there, but to substitute this Christian uh, figure for um, other earlier um, uh, figures of devotion. Um, and it simply actually made him visible, right? He, he became something of a spectacle there atop his column in a way that according to his lives, he didn't seek, but that he couldn't, uh, couldn't get away from. Um, so all of these are functions of the column that again, make him different from other people, put him in a different place um, and uh, signify him as the, the, the portal to uh, 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 an interaction with the divine. And building out now from the body to the column to the site as a whole, uh, you know, Rebecca and I have thought about the ways in which the church, after Simeon's death, took over this site to build it out uh, around the relic of the column so that it could welcome so many visitors. Um, and I, I want to be sure to say that his body was not here. After he died, his body was taken down from the column. It was taken to um, Antioch, uh, where it was entombed. So his body lies elsewhere. And yet the column and the cult site around the column really, in the end, trumped the tomb as the place of primary devotion to him. And if I were to get into the all the architectural details, uh, I would 
talk to you about this building as uh, kind of a marriage of the two early um, early Christian uh, sort of building types going back to um, earlier centuries, um, the centrally planned form, which you see here at the center of the church, and the basilican forms, which uh, create the arms uh, of, of the cross form here. Um, so this, this weds those two forms into uh, a multifunctional site, both for veneration of the saint and for regular worship, and huge, as you can see here, able to accommodate 10,000 worshipers and accessible by more than 25 different doors uh, to the interior. And were you to be coming to honor, to venerate Simeon, your journey, well, your journey began at home as a pilgrim, but the, the, the choreographing of one's final approach to the site um, begins in the town below and moves along a sacred way uh, with a triumphal arch that, um, you know, that, that marked uh, a, a point in the journey. So it was a fairly arduous climb up this steep hillside, uh, but framed by uh, monumental architecture and lined with stalls and other um, more ephemeral buildings that served pilgrims. The church itself sits on the highest part of the site and near the edge of the, the promontory on which it's built. So uh, I, I think you were always climbing up to it, um, uh, again, as the climax. And it's been suggested that the form of this token, which is kind of lozenge shaped with a convex upper and lower surface, that the very form of the token signals um, the form of the mountainside, right? So that there's a movement up the curved surface to the apex, and at the apex is where you encounter the saint. So on the apex of the, um, of the lozenge, you see the image of Simeon on his column, just as you would have come into um, the presence of the holy when you came into the octagon, the central martyrium honoring this, um, this saint. So all these frames, both before and even after one's uh, visit to, to the building. And I don't think I can emphasize enough what I described earlier as, as this centripetal movement to the martyrium. Of course, a pilgrim leaving takes that power away with him or her in these holy objects, in these tokens, and possibly even in one's own changed heart um, after that pilgrimage. Geometrically, this is a work that certainly draws on late Roman uh, architecture and um, later early Christian works. So um, the kind of geometric verve of the octagon um, goes back as far as uh, the octagonal hall in uh, Nero's palace in Rome. Um, by way of a work like this, an early Christian baptistry, um, the baptistry of the Orthodox in Ravenna, which is octagonal um, in form, that uh, number eight symbolizing new life here. But even the baptistry partakes of the symbolism of the tomb, um, as in these imperial examples, because of course, in undergoing the rite of baptism, one puts one's sinful self to death and emerges newborn uh, from the water. So these are the architectural precedents that I think give not only a beautiful geometry to the building, but also pack a powerful symbolism um, as well, rooted in um, earlier uh, Roman architecture. And so here, this, this quotation from Theodoret, the Bishop of Cyrus, so uh, a prelate um, of standing in the church, representing the institution of the church, 
it's interesting to me, he says, uh, cures of diseases of every kind, miracles and acts of divine power are accomplished even now, just as when Simeon was alive, not only at the tomb of the holy relics in Antioch, but also by the memorial of his heroism and long contending. I mean, the great and celebrated pillar of this righteous and much lauded Simeon. So the agency of this relic framed as it is within this monumental architecture is absolutely made clear um, in this statement, which of course sought to promote pilgrimage to the site and upheld the power that one might encounter there. Now, just to, to bring this to a conclusion, um, we know that in the 200 years after the death of Simeon, the elder, there were some 20 other stylite saints in that part of the world. Um, and uh, the author I have named here, Lucas Schachner, has um, used GIS data, uh, drawing on archaeological data, to um, uh, locate those, locate and map those other sites. Right, so there were many uh, imitators of Simeon. Um, and uh, here is a, a detail of one of his maps, which I think really begins to make the case for what um, this scholar Charles Stang claimed that saints are revelations of the divine hierophanies that organize undifferentiated space. There begins to be a larger, almost regional, space of exceptional holiness, exceptional piety and asceticism um, with all of these uh, successor stylites. And to go back to Peter Brown, what's fascinating about his study is that he shows how the holy man comes to fill a gap when imperial power declined or was complicated and you had the these far-flung villages uh, of the empire left without what had been the conventional powers of an earlier period. And so he talks about a proliferation of little centers of power that competed with the vested hierarchy of church, the capital C, and state with a capital S. Um, the clear outlines of imperial bureaucracy strike the casual observer, I think that's clear, but they were incessantly obfuscated by a fibrous growth of informal, unarticulated relationships. And I think that phrase, the fibrous growth of these other relationships is, is one of his wonderful turns of phrase to get at something essentially new in this period, which was the emergence of the holy man, not just as an exemplar of piety, but as someone who had power in the world to um, uh, solve certain problems in the world, in the belief of um, uh, you know, the holy man's fellow, uh, fellow uh, Christians. So here again, that whole site, um, which uh, provides one a departure from um, ordinary life outside provides one access to the sacred um, and this column, which was so imbued with the presence of Simeon, even after his death uh, and after his body was taken elsewhere. So um, that is uh, the end of what I, I want to show you, um, except I have two slides left to show what's happened to this site in the current Syrian civil war. So uh, superimposed on this plan are these red stars that show where there have been missile strikes here. So like so much in Syria, this site has suffered as well. And in particular, uh, a missile strike that actually seems to have uh, come from Russian forces um, displaced that one remaining column drum um, off the pedestal. So that's the latest um, information I have about the site, uh, but I hope it will not be further damaged um, in this war. 
So I'm going to stop sharing now so I can see you all and I'm happy to take questions and comments. You went to Santa Fe. Have you been to the Santuario de Simayo? Um, I have, yes, not on this trip, but on one prior trip. It's a uh -huh. fascinating place with all the, um, uh, you know, all the things left by pilgrims there. Yes. Yeah. I don't recall any columns in the building. <laughs> No, I don't think so. I think it's, it, it, I mean, the sanctuary itself is, is uh, adobe walls, isn't it? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this, I, I don't know any local site for the veneration of Simeon. So, uh, you know, I, I actually don't have a sense of whether that cult made its way across the ocean to us or not. So uh, these columns you discussed, are all related to Simeon. Um, yes, in this instance, there there are okay. there are other column saints, and so the columns are part of their iconography as well. And we do know that there were stylite saints in Western Europe. In fact, the last one was as recent as the nineteenth century. So somehow this kind of ascetic practice did persist, you know, even much closer to our own era. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the column uh, capitals. Why do they look like egg cups? So that's, that's part of the, um, well, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back to images. So I'm, are you referring to something uh, that's actually sculpted or some of the painted imagery of it? Oh, I'm talking about the, the, <clears throat> the sculptures. Well, and also the images that Simeon seems to always be sitting in an egg cup on the top <laughs> of a pole. <laughs> I, I think that's an effort to represent, there was an enclosure that was built around the platform on which he stood. Uh -huh. I think when I first encountered Simeon, you know, read about him, I was picturing him on this platform way up in the air, like just with this, sheer drop to the ground below but there yes. was something of a railing or a platform that or yeah a railing that surrounded the platform <laughs> um, which is interesting because from this perspective of liminality that again defines his space not just to protect his body but defines his space as distinct from the space even of the monks who are serving him um, so in that uh, stone relief where you see the acolyte climbing the ladder to him. The acolyte has a sensor, right? Mm -hmm. So the um, the smoke from the sensor would uh, would have been in 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 actuality regarded as um, a sign of holiness, and then it's replicated um, in those sculptures as a you know iconography of holiness for the saint. So he's always in his own space. Nobody else penetrates into that space. Um, and I think the railing helps to make that clear. Hmm. Other questions? I just had a comment that considering the damage that's done there, I think what is going to be needed for visitors when they ever get there is one of these augmented reality <laughs> systems where you can hold up your phone and see what it used to look like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they use that sort of thing now in a lot of uh, tourist uh, applications. For instance, at the Papal Palace in Avignon, yeah. you are issued a little iPad sort of thing and you can hold it up and see a populated dining hall with all of the popes and people in, in place. And uh, so I'm afraid that's gonna be necessary in Syria all over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing. I had never thought of that, but that's a wonderful comment. And um, indeed, there's so much, there's so many different kinds of augmentation that could be provided, not just the life of Simeon and his practice and the lives and stuff, but even with respect to the, um, you know, the architecture of the site, it suffered 
not just during the Syrian civil war, but also during the conflicts between the Byzantines and the Arabs. So it changed hands several times in the Middle Ages. It was damaged and refortified at that time. Um, and so, you know, there are these successive conflicts in the area, including the one uh, in our current day, that have had uh, their impact um, on that architecture. So e that's a fascinating story to tell as well, um, just to understand what, what was and how it has changed and been shored up or preserved or not preserved um, over time. Maybe we need, need somebody to get over right quick to Ukraine <laughs> where they seem to be trying to bury the artwork. Yes. Yeah. As yeah. we speak. Yeah. Just an in, uh, yeah, the indiscriminate shelling there is, is so, is so shocking, I think. Yes. Well, uh, apparently they're trying to hit things of cultural significance as well. Yeah. Not yeah. only medical and humane, but, but yeah. also. Um, I, I know only one person who's been to Kalat Siman in Syria. Uh, it, it was a man who was the former dean of the uh, College of Architecture at Georgia Tech. And he had written a book on Jerusalem, the history of Jerusalem sort of broadly construed. And I think in, in the course of research for that book, visited the site with a guide, you know, quite a number of years ago. And uh, when he told me that, I, I was so jealous. It's a site I would love to see. Um, but it seems pretty perilous right now. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think it was fairly remote, um, you know, for him uh, in the day when he went. More thoughts and questions? I'm curious to ask you what you think about the contemporary works of, of augmented reality. Do those seem they, compelling to you or do they seem just sort of newfangled? They so, seem sort of like uh, the old, uh, what did they call those little things that had, had the um, two photos Oh, the stereoscope. Stereoscopes, um, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> they're, they're about as uh, compelling as those. Yeah. yeah. I've seen several different ones now, and I'm not impressed. Well, of course, we're, see we're not seeing them. We're not in the presence of those things. We're seeing them through, you know, recordings on the, on the internet. So they might be more powerful in person. Oh, uh, no, I've seen them in person. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're not buying it. Yeah. Linda, Linda Jack has a question or a comment. On mute. I'm muting. Uh, thank you. Uh, really, really interesting talk. I'm. I couldn't help but be thinking when you showed the Lincoln uh, projections on the Lincoln statue, um, with all the Confederate statues that are coming down or being moved. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you have seen any augmentation or virtual reality about how those statues are going to be treated once yeah. they've come down off their pedestals and gone to other sites. That's a wonderful question. I, I haven't. I mean, I'm not. Um, I have two colleagues who are Americanists, so I, I sort of leave them their territory and I occupy a different territory. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not very well informed about that, but you, you raise an interesting question because even if one feels that that imagery is objectionable today and should come down, there's a larger history to be told about how, you know, sort of the, um, the, 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 the phenomenon of the lost cause of the of the war and the confederacy and the cultivation of memory there and and um I, I i'm not saying that's a laudable story but it's an interesting story that tells you something about the history of our country in that period um and i like the idea that there could be these um augmented reality um, um applications of one sort or another that might capture what i like about 
or I think what Rebecca and I find so compelling about augmented reality is that precisely because it does not purport to be a holistic, singular world that's created, you know, there, there can be a little friction between the layers. There can be some tension that is a challenge to interpretation that seeks to put you into um, a questioning frame of mind. And that I find very compelling. And if that opened up any of the historical sites in our country to further scrutiny, just, and to further understanding, I think that would be well worth it. Um, mm. And, I, and this is I, the kind the of work reason. that Rebecca is, is doing in some, some of her work at historical sites is trying to activate the fragmentary remains of some situation in the past. And it's not just make them available, but to somehow make them meaningful again, but, but in ways that are not predicated to you. Instead, you're provided with information. You decide, you know, you decide what you want to think about those things and you decide which um, of that information that's offered through these augmentations is valuable to you or compelling to you. I, the reason I ask, I, for reasons I won't explain, I've been reviewing some of the uh, Confederate states. Um, when they decided to secede, they published all of their collective thoughts uh, in the Southern states. And when I was reading everything they had to say about why they were seceding, I just, for some reason, I imagined those words being reflected on the statues of the men who meant that they're all men yeah. who were saying them yeah. and how powerful a way that might be to pull people back to 1862 yeah. or whenever it was yeah. um, to actually hear what they were saying at the time, mm. which, you know, pretty much makes the case for yeah. slavery being the whole reason that they all seceded. Um, yeah. So when I saw that, it just made me think that that would be a one way to kind of make it real, you know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you're saying, because even with a figure who, see, who seems less problematic, less fully problematic, someone like Lincoln, that statue in Union Square apparently was pretty reviled at the time it was erected. People didn't like it stylistically, you know, it, I don't know a lot about it, but um, it's, it's, it, it's never been a beloved statue of Lincoln. And um, so in some ways, Vodichko's work, and it was a temporary work, right? It's, it was, it, it, there was a performance period of a month or something when, when he uh, did those projections. But somehow it just brought, for, I think it brought that statue back into some currency that it had completely lost, you know, this unbeloved, disregarded statue kind of plunked down in, in a part of the park that was busy with other activities. I, I think it, it sort of made it visible in a new way. And that, that's, um, that's a powerful move uh, for me. Thank you. Bob Nyden and then Corky. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the augmented reality that I've seen, which was the one in, in Arl, or not Arl, at uh, Avignon. Yeah. And one of the things that I like about studying history is trying to figure out what life was really like. You know, what, what were they doing and what did the place look like? So when you hold up these little iPads and, and you just move around, they're there are moving figures in them. They're toasting each other, they're doing things and you can see the hangings on the wall. And instead of being just a big empty stone room, uh, it, it means more uh, to the visitor. The, the danger is that what I saw is a lot of people just walking around looking at the iPad <laughs> instead of looking at what was really there. Yeah. But what I would like is something like that in Herculaneum or Pompeii where you can walk down the street and feel the stones under your foot and yeah. turn around and look at a restored fresco in one of these buildings. And that to me would be, I think, a, at least a fun way to use the augmented reality. Yeah, well, 
and those would be perfect sites. You know, when, when I was much younger and visiting Rome for the first time, I would have said the Roman Forum would be a place for that because there I was with my blue guide, you know, very dutifully reading these dense passages. But it was not something I had studied in any class at that point. And it, it was just absolutely illegible to me, you know, what these buildings were. And, and there are many reconstruction drawings, of course, um, but they weren't available to me right there on, on the site. So visualizing how crowded the forum was and what all these different buildings were, it, it was impossible at the time. And um, your discussion of the iPad or something is interesting because that's a handheld thing. There's no illusion that you're in the that you're in the life of the past, right? You're not invited. Well, maybe I don't know. You're not invited to be, you know, a courtier to the Pope or or whatever. It's it's definitely distinct. It's a representation, and yet it provides information to you in a fairly easy way. An example I didn't show that Rebecca and I think is a poor example of augmented reality was something she experienced at the Basilica in Montreal. Um, and it was one of these kind of fantastical light shows where some company had been commissioned to do these phantasmagoric images that were keyed to music um, on the inside, in the interior of the building. And um, you know, some of them seem to respect the, the neo-Gothic forms of the building, but others were um, like a layering of images from nature, waves and trees and things. And sure, we could make some kind of abstruse connection with medieval theology or something, but, but in her experience, it was pure spectacle. And nothing that, not only did it not add to her experience of the building, it detracted from it, right? There was nothing she learned. There was nothing she felt was an authentic experience of that building, of that sacred building um, made available through that particular augmentation. So um, it's not that either of us think that augmentation per se is necessarily good. There can be good examples and bad examples, uh, but we're interested in, in precisely how you're offered an invitation not to stand in front of a spectacle and ooh and ah, but instead to step into more knowledge of something from the past or from the present uh, by means of, of that augmentation. Hmm. Corky? Um, to your question about what we think about AR and VR, I thought I'd better say something because I've worked in video games for the last 30 years. And okay. Much of what you're saying is what everyone thinks now that VR is a bit of a dead end as a technology. Um, I think it will come again, but it's definitely at a low ebb. And there's a little bit more excitement about the potential of AR. Um, one, just I just thought I'd mention one thing you might be interested in. There's a company called Trip, if you don't know, with two Ps, T-R-I-P-P. -P. Mm -hmm. And they are a VR company who works with academics to do research studies on how VR can help well-being. So yeah. it's, it's a meditation program. Um, mm -hmm. And on the idea of liminality, actually, I was struck by your picture of the, the arched windows. Yeah. They're currently working with um, psilocybin as a mm. altered state drug that helps veterans and other people. Oh, wow. But the, but the idea of liminality that you, um, you go into a virtual reality app pre-taking psilocybin. Mm -hmm. and during and then after and mm. um it's being used by the researchers anyway to to suggest that that uh it helps your everyday life if you do it yeah interesting and and to put a um to put a sort of med meditative practice at your fingertips in a way is is um, a, a lovely idea. I'll definitely look that up. I don't know that company. My, my colleague may, but uh, because she's she's in that world. Um, but uh, thank you. And and I'm curious to ask you back about you know what you say is sort of the current dead end of, of VR. Is it? 
is it that somehow we're at the limits of current technology and there's nothing more that can be done right now with what we have? Or is it that those claims that I said we have found somewhat objectionable or simply unfulfilled, that others feel that too, that there, there was, um, you know, a, a sense of the magnitude of this achievement or potential in the past that, that hasn't quite been realized. I'm just curious what, why you think it's at a bit of a dead end right now. Um, good question. Um, I'm being recorded, so I have to watch what I answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think four years ago, there was a technological problem that when you're in VR, you still felt sick often. And uh, the mm. movement that it was caused could be fixed by better technology and better visuals. So that's getting a bit better. I think though the, the, the image you showed of the guy wearing the goggles where yeah. he looks kind of ridiculous and he's mm. isolated from his friends and he's having an experience that's, he's described it as solipsism, I think. Yeah. Um, that is a problem. And most gamers are really social people and they like to be with their friends and they don't want to go in a corner of the room on their own. Yeah. It, it's funny in architecture, uh, students can, you know, they have ways of testing their digital models, you know, via uh, um, VR. And sometimes those are brought to bear in studio reviews, but I just don't, I don't find those very compelling. And, and, um, there's something about scale there and textures. And, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I, I've experienced it often enough in that context to put my finger on what seems so thin about it. But, you know, you tend to be yeah. offered this thing, like here's a realistic experience of the building I'm designing. And I'm just thinking this is not, it is a thinking to me. <laughs> it is a bit thin that on the trip, maybe one thing you said then that's interesting, they, they're trying to simulate in a virtual reality the experience of awe, which mm. is a really good concept, right? If you think, make something that's awesome, that when I go in there, it just makes my mouth drop. Yeah. Um, I think VR can do that, but it's about a minute long experience, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Awe doesn't last very long. Well, that's interesting, an interesting comment. So the limits of computing power, you know, in the in the early days of architectural renderings, right, the, the amount of computer power it took was such that you, you had these kind of super quick fly throughs of buildings, you know, from vantage points that you would never occupy at a speed <laughs> you would never achieve. Yeah. And they're just, they just, they really did not seem to me to communicate even as well as static drawings that are well done in terms of perspectival views or you know, particular vantage points in the building. So I, I never understood the appeal of those, um, but maybe, I mean, to be fair, maybe it really is a, a, a technological or possibly at that point in time, even a hardware challenge you know, to, to um, uh, manipulate uh, that data. Roy Miles. <clears throat> Roy, you have a question or a comment? Unmute. I was thinking about a UNESCO project when the extremists blew up the great uh, Buddha had been yeah. carved out of the uh, yeah. UNESCO initiated a, a project, virtual reality, to recreate what the great Buddha was. And I, mm -hmm. I've never looked for what happened to that project. I assume it was completed. Yeah. But I've never gone and looked for it. What's your view of that? Like you could recreate this entire uh, place from knowledge and projection. Yeah. How real would it be? Who knows? Right. Well, that's, that's a complicated question. I mean, and I, I feel pulled in different directions because of course, um, even <laughs> historians are sometimes <laughs> seduced by the, the, the ruined state of something and the sense that it's imprinted with all these events over time, um, you know, that have resulted in that ruined state. Uh, but in terms of, for instance, when I talked about the 
influence of earlier explorations of geometry in Roman architecture, the influence of that on, on Kalat Simon, you have to have a sense of things holistically to begin to do that sort of investigation. <coughs> and so what you're proposing for me is, for me personally, is maybe less important in terms of somehow recapturing some experience of the place than simply understanding um, the, the whole composition and trying to think about how the parts fit together and, and so on and so forth. You need to have an accurate sense of the building, you know, as accurate as you can get as it was built to begin to um, undertake that kind of analysis. John Wilkes. Hi, Hi Laura. My, my apologies, my, my camera is having a bad day. Oh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the talk. I just wanted to, to echo something so Andrew said. I think the, my personal experience with the virtual reality stuff is still in it looks artificial, right? You, you yeah. can tell it's not real. However, I do want to report on an amazingly positive experience with augmented reality. Um, in Rome at the Arapasis, the altar. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They had for a few weeks, when I happened to be there at the time, they would let you sort of get some um, uh, sort of phone-based goggles and you could see, using the camera and the phone, you could see the thing, but it would also project onto the surface of the, the, uh, the altar, the sort of um, annotations and uh, highlighting yeah. the various bits and pieces. So it was a wonderful way of gaining information and understanding what was going on. So there, I think, you know, you obviously knew it was artificial. So you didn't have the limitation of trying to pretend that you were experiencing reality because reality is always better. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but this, this is a way of sort of getting the best of both. Well, that's, that's great. I'll have to look for that the next time I'm in Rome. And uh, your description of the, um, you know, things sort of projected onto the monument itself is fascinating because in that museum, which was um, designed by Richard Meyer, I believe, uh, I wonder if you had an experience that I had. So, you know, the, the, um, the altar is there, there are glazed walls. So walls of glass to either side with fins that extend from them. And the movement of traffic around the building casts these changing patterns of light on the altar itself, which at first I found kind of distracting, but later I thought was fascinating because you get these um, uh, lines of light, kind of reflected light, creating sinuous patterns over the sculpture of the altar. And, uh, I don't know if that was intended, but I thought it was a fascinating effect that made me more attentive to some of the lines in the composition than I would have been otherwise. So um, it almost sounds like this um, this uh, AR application builds on on that experience. And maybe not uh, maybe not consciously, but um, I like the idea. These these projections, of course, create no damage they do no damage to the yes. monument but they do allow us to see it in a different way and uh, in time which i think is valuable too yep thanks yeah thank you thank you laura um evelyn tells me you'd like to uh end this fairly early so that you can go have supper <laughs> that's right <laughs> i i had said i was going to head off to dinner after this so uh, i mean if there are any more questions or comments i'm happy to take them but uh also should head off before too long. <laughs> thank you for coming. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks for uh, your willingness to hear a talk that combined uh, contemporary and medieval things. Um, it always feels like a bit of a risk doing that uh, because I'm not sure that everyone likes moving back and forth in time like that. But um, for me in my current situation, as I say, in a in a school of architecture with people who are designers themselves today, you know, being willing to do that has been one way to, you know, really have a vital dialogue with them while trying to keep uh, one foot in the medieval world. It's fascinating for us to hear a bit of it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation and thanks to um, Virginia for making me aware of the group originally and uh, Virginia so glad you were feeling well enough to join tonight. Yes.
It must be wonderful to get to follow you around as you talk about architecture. So now we need an augmented space in which we can follow you around as you talk, look at and talk about architecture. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. You know, it's, it's funny, the last time that I did some extended lectures by Zoom, it was in um, uh, a program here at the U of A called the Humanities Seminars Program, which in essence is a sort of a continuing education program, but very well funded and well, um, well subscribed by people in the community. But I, I did two courses for them last year, and uh, one was called Localizing the Sacred. So Kalat Siman was um, the topic of the first lecture, and then there were three other sites. Uh, and then I did one entitled The Long Reach of Roman Architecture Before the Renaissance. And um, so these allowed me to travel at a time when, of course, under COVID restrictions, nobody was going anywhere. Um, so it was fun to share these different sites with people. Well, thank you. We'll let you go to thank dinner you. now. Okay. <laughs> Come back. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It was thank a pleasure you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.